Well, hello, everybody. This is uh, the Happy Campers interview series, and you just missed some major technological scrambling that Julie and I were just doing. So it's like a mini technological miracle that we're here with you at 12.04 p.m. today on Tuesday. <laughs> We did it, but um, it required multiple devices and some like seeking support tech because yes. you know what? We're camp people, not tech people. <laughs> and so, yes. So anyway, the Happy Campers interview series is a series that I've been doing. I'm interviewing really amazing camp directors who have been at their camps for so many years and are very committed to the social and emotional and character growth of their campers. And Walton's Grizzly Lodge is certainly one of those amazing programs uh, due in no small part to Julie Walton, who is one of four directors there. So Julie, welcome to the series. I'm so glad you're here. So, so glad you're here. <laughs> we did it. We absolutely did it. And I was thinking about camp and those exact words you just said, I'm not in the tech business, I'm in the kid business, um, but we are in the connecting business, right? So we did manage to connect you and I, here we are. Great miracle, as you said, thanks for having so, me. Uh, sure, Julie, talk about your background, both kind of before camp and even some of the things that you do simultaneous with camp, because I think listeners will love to get to know you. Sure, sure. Well, um, I am not a camp kid. I never went to summer camp as a kid, although I tried to let get my parents to let me go. And um, I got it. Nah, I don't think we're going to do that. So um, I never went as a child, although when I was in high school, I was able to be a camp counselor for our local elementary school science camp. And um, as the uh, luck would have it, I was assigned to a group of boys. So as a 17 year old high school student, they gave me a group of about 12 boys and just said, you're gonna be great, really. Um, I had very little training <laughs> and needless to say, it was quite an experience, um, but one that I really did love. So that was my first step into camping. Um, I did grow up go cam going camping, but not in a traditional summer camp setting. Um, so fast forward, I was in college, I was studying um, uh, to get a business degree. And I thought, you know, I need a summer job. And I got offered a job from Walton's Grizzly Lodge summer camp. Um, I shared that story with my parents and they were like, Walton's Grizzly Lodge? I think that's the camp you wanted to go to when you were a kid. So my mom loves to tell the story. Well, now you get to go to Walton's Grizzly Lodge. So um, I did go to Walton's Grizzly Lodge. This is over 30 years ago. And um, it really had a profound effect on my life. You hear that from so many people, whether they are campers or staff members or people just have had a connection with summer camp. Um, I went to camp. I changed my major the very next year. Um, I ended up becoming an elementary school teacher so that I could continue to go back to camp summer after summer. I met my husband there, met most of my best friends there. And um, I, again, became a school teacher so that I could go back to camp so that I could focus my off-season life on working with kids. Um, when my husband's parents retired, uh, we took over the business along with his brother, uh, Jared, and his wife, Erica. And so now the four of us own and direct camp. And that's what I do. Um, how long, Julie, did you teach and what grade level? Sure. So I taught for 10 years, elementary school, mostly, you know, from second grade through sixth grade. I was in public education at a time when there um, was actually a lot more funding for some different um, approaches to education. So at one point, I actually had a multi-age classroom. So I had third, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders in my classroom. Wow. And, uh, you know, I look back now and I talk to teachers who are teaching now and they say that how could you meet every single need of every single child? And they're all different grades. And, um, you know, that same approach to a multi-age classroom is very similar to camp in that they're just all individuals. Just because two children are in the same grade does not mean that they are at the same level, have the same needs, need the same approach. Um, and, and that's a lot like camp in that. You know, our kids are all there um, with different needs, um, different expectations. They bring a different skill set to the community. Um, and we really need to meet them where they are. So, um, yeah, 10 years. But then I had my first daughter. 
and I stayed home. Well, actually, Adam stayed home the first year with her, um, and that was wonderful for him, but um, I was just really wanting to do that as well. So teaching, uh, I left teaching and uh, focused on raising our girls and camp. That is amazing. I think you're a perfect example of, you know, sometimes, I mean, we've talked about this before, how people think when they hear the word camp director, it doesn't really bring to mind, you know, some very professional kind of image for most people. Mm -hmm. But you're a perfect example of a camp director who has a vast amount of knowledge and training and experience with kids that you brought to your role and that you still bring to your role. So I think that parents could be really reassured to know <laughs> if they send their kid to Walton's that you have a lot of experience there beyond just your, how many years is it now at camp? Well, I say 30 something, 32, 31, 30. I don't know. We just do okay. decades now, Audrey. We just it's, decades. Yeah. It's three decades. It's a lot of time, a lot of kids, a lot of experience at camp. Okay. So let's talk about Walton's, like where you are and the ages of your kids that come and just all that good stuff. Because many people listening are probably not at all familiar with summer camp in general mm -hmm. or Walton's in, in particular. So as if okay. you're talking to someone who knows nothing about camp or Walton's, talk about your program and everything. All right. Well, so Walton's Grizzly Lodge was founded in 1926 in San Francisco um, by mom and pop Walton. And it started out as a school. And uh, mom Walton was a woman ahead of her time. She started a school named a ch called a child's garden. Pop Walton was the bus driver. And um, they absolutely had their hands in every part of that school. So mom taught, pop drove, um, the kids obviously learned all the basics, reading, writing, and math, but they also learned um, a lot about the arts and science, um, and it was a beloved school. It was so beloved that the story has been told to me that the kids really wanted a summer program um, as well. So they started a program in the summer in Lagunitas, the summer camp there in Marin County, San Francisco Bay Area. And then eventually they moved it up to the site where it is now in the 1940s. And that site is in Plumas County, so about an hour from Truckee, near Lake Tahoe, um, and it's been there ever since. We have our own lake, and Camp Life is really situated around that lake, a historic lodge that was built when they used to harvest ice off the lake there. So um, you'll hear our lake referred to as Grizzly Ice Pond, um, because before refrigeration, that's where they got the ice. You may have heard of all these different ice ponds in the area up there. Um, let's see about camp. So we started at age seven and we go till 14. There's a leadership program for our 15 and 16 year olds and um, kids come for one week or two weeks or they'll come for a whole month when they combine sessions. We have a week long backpacking program. That's our outdoor adventure program. Um, and again, camp life really situa is situated around our lake right there over 40 different activity choices so kids can water ski or they can go to the ropes course there's a skate park and the tennis courts and the horseback ride and on and on and on and on and on and so on. tell me and yeah exactly okay so it's boys and girls how many yeah. campers do you have at one time at walton's 175 campers at a time Okay. Yeah. And I think it's kind of unique. One of the things that you've told me about is how kids get to sort of pick what they want to do, how that process works. So right. explain sort of that, um, that autonomy that kids get and how it works for sure. what kids figure out what they're doing each day at Walton's. Well, I love to talk about this part. Um, I especially love to talk about it because it reminds me of Grandpa Joe, who um, just passed away this year at 97. Just an amazing, an amazing man. And he was the one who developed the way that we run our program in this process of campers choosing their own activities. So um, three times a day, campers choose their activities. In the morning, they get to choose their two morning activities. In the afternoon, they choose two more. And then in the evening, there's a, an opportunity for a fifth activity period. Um, and it is really one of the things that makes our camp really unique and adds to the culture of our camp. It dovetails really nicely with the philosophy of our camp, um, this idea of making choices. Um, and kids don't always get their first choice. Sometimes they don't get their second choice. Sometimes they don't even get their third choice. Most of the time, though, they get one of their top choices. Um, and that whole process is really a, a lot about who we are and uh, what we value in a camp program. 
Do you talk to the kids about uh, picking things, even if their friends aren't doing it and sort of having that kind of self direction that you want to try something, even if your friends aren't? We do. Yeah. You know, it's built into our um, whole program, our whole orientation, um, our getting to know campers in the first, you know, few hours that they're even there. So a big topic of conversation when kids come up among their groups with their counselors are, what are you most excited to try? You know, what is it? Why are you here? You know, what do you hope to do? Um, and beyond just the activities, you know, um, make new friends or, you know, be away from home or whatever those things are. But in addition, their activity choices. Um, and then as campers are starting to choose those activities, the conversations around the table, around um, their dorm life is really around, what do you guys think you might do tomorrow? Counselors know, well, I'm going to just go with my friend, which I like to do that too. I like to go where Audrey Monkey's going, right? We just were at a conference. Where are you going, Audrey? I want to go. Because we can talk about it. We can share in that. So it's a big part of it. But another big part is I really want to go to archery. And Audrey, you, my friend doesn't want to go to art, you know, I don't know. And, but I really do, but I'm not going to go. But, and so counselors really stepping in, like, Hey, what would happen if you went? It's one period. You're not signing up for it for life. You're not, you know, committing to this as your, you know, hobby forever. So, um, yes, it's a big part of us getting kids to step out of that comfort zone, to go without friends, to go do things they maybe thought they would never like, or that they're afraid of or whatever reason. Yeah, that's amazing. And that is kind of unique. So it's a cool aspect of your program. And I'm sure a lot of your kids really enjoy that ability to decide what they want to do. And I also think even the not getting your first choice thing is part of life too, because isn't that kind of life that you have to be flexible and depending on what happens, things don't always go the way you planned. And so learning to bounce back from maybe minor disappointments, it's also probably a good skill that they learn. I, I have a favorite story. We'll have, you know, we have lots of favorite stories as camp directors, but one of my current favorites is um, I was walking through camp and there was a young camper about 10 years old and just sitting, just, you know, that look that like this day is just the pits. Like it's summer. What, how, come on. What's going on? So I said, Hey, what's going on? It's like, oh, I have to go to beach games. I don't even know what beach games is. I don't even want to go. I don't even, I have to go. They're making me it's like, who, well, who's making you? Well, the story ends up, he chose it, but he chose it because his very first choice was not available. And besides, he had already been to that very first choice several times. So you can't live at the skate park and, and other kids needed an opportunity to go. And so, gosh darn it, he had to go to beach games and he was disappointed and he didn't even know what it was. And it was an outrage. And this is just stinks. You know, it was a big deal. We chatted, we talked, I'll go with you. I don't really want you to go with me, Julie. All right, I'll go by myself. Okay, tell me how that goes. All right, he stands up, he sits back down. I don't even know where it is. See, beach games is stupid. <laughs> Long story short, he goes to beach games. I walked him around, I came back. I see him at lunch, beach games. When are they offering beach games again? This is my favorite thing in the world. Do you, he's a beach games ambassador because he went down there. He had the time of his life. He couldn't even believe it. Anyway, so yes, sometimes you don't get your first choice, your second choice, and then you're a beach games ambassador. Okay, that's so funny. I have a, a blog post that I wrote called The Blessing of the Least Favorite Activity. And I based it on the Wendy Mogul book, you know, The Blessing of the Skin Me, yeah. and how a lot of times that growth and the great things happen when we least expect it or when something is like we have a negative attitude about something and then we turn it around. So that's a great story. I love that story. Um, yeah. So, okay. So also you have a long tradition. So you guys, so pop, wait, so, so Ma and Pa Walton started the camp. Mm -hmm. Are you guys the third or fourth generation? We're the to fourth be generation owners and directors. Yep. Okay. Which yeah. is really a cool thing. And what year was it started again? 1926. Okay, so you're coming up on, it'll be 100 years in just uh, yeah, seven coming, years. In fact, right before we got, you know, in our scramble to get the tech right, I was saying to my husband, how many years is it? Goes, 
seriously? I'm like, it's 94, <laughs> right? Or he's just laughing. It's like, hey, we're going Facebook Live. I need to know. So yeah, coming up on 100. That's amazing. And so I imagine a lot of your campers might be children or even grandchildren of past campers. Do you have that kind of like family yes, tradition? We do. You know, a second generation and third generation campers. And we have a, like I said, we have this big historic lodge. And um, one of the things that is on the wall are plaques with campers names who are second generation and so when I first started there um, you know the, the names were hanging on the wall and the change the amount of names that are on that wall the big discussion now when we get together as a family is what are we going to do with all of these plaques like we, we need to figure out where we're going to put them all there's so many kids who are coming now from um, families who have grown up with camps. So yeah, it's wonderful. That is so great. That's a good problem to have. Maybe you just need to build a new lodge. Yeah, a museum. Bigger. I'm yeah. yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. Um, okay, so that's great. I think that, you know, for families who've experienced a camp, a specific, you know, specifically their own camp, how wonderful it is for them to send their kids. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about what it's like for a brand new family, never been to Walton's, first time going to camp. Right. Is it, you know, I because I think that sometimes people who aren't familiar with it think, well, everybody will know each other or I didn't go there or whatever. So I'm sure a lot of your campers, their parents didn't come to Walton's. Right. So talk about what you do to welcome in new families, first time campers. How do you help them, you know, acclimate to Walton's? Well, and I, I know you know this, Audrey, this is so common that phone rings and I get a mom typically or a dad who is, starts with this big, hi, um, I, I really want my child to go to camp and, and they really want to go, but, and then dot, 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 right? The parent is so worried about there's a list of things. And oftentimes at the top of that list is, well, all of these kids know each other, right? Am mm -hmm. I sending my child into this camp that's been around since 1926? And Julie on Facebook Live just said they have to build another lodge to put all the names in there. Why am I going to you know, send my kid into this situation? When the reality of that is, even if your parents went to camp or your grandparents, it's new for every child the first time they go to camp. And we understand that. My husband and I and his brother, Jared, and his wife, Erica, we're all parents. And we send our kids off to various, you know, um, experiences, um, knowing that it can be challenging for them, you know, when they get there. So part of the camp experience, whether you're brand new to camp, um, our camp and your family is or not, is engaging on that first day in making sure kids very basic needs are met, you know, where to go, you know, who your person is to ask questions, you know, how to navigate the lay of the land, everything from camp, all of the traditions. What does that bell mean? We're going into the lodge, you know, where do I sit for this? Um, so all set up so that campers know where to be and how to navigate. And then of course, we're working with our counselors very closely on how to help children make friends. A simple thing as knowing each other's names. That seems like maybe a very tiny thing, but kids need to know everybody's name in the group. We need to practice it. Some kids, it takes a little bit longer. Um, and so the counselor's working with the kids just to know the names of the kids in their group, a little bit about everybody, connecting campers, maybe someone who's been there before, somebody who hasn't, go set the table together. So that especially in the first 24 hours, the focus is on really bringing those kids together. And I hear it all the time parents bring their kid to Walton's Grizzly Lodge. They're a little nervous that they're a first time camper. They sit down with them. Oh, there's my husband. Hey, Adam. Come say hi to Audrey. Oh, there. <laughs> hey, Adam. It's really a mom and pop shop here. He's getting, let's see. Oh, he's getting the special events binder because we're working on something Great. really awesome. top secret. Anyway, when they get there, parents will say goodbye to their camper. And oftentimes they're like, oh, you know, they, I, I, there seems to be a lot of kids that know each other or I, you know, my child seemed a little quiet and the parents go, we have lunch. And I'm telling you, it's a, just a few hours before it feels like those previous connections aren't there. Kids are connecting with people. Um, it's very intentional. So um, yeah, it can be hard for parents for sure um, who haven't had that experience. But once um, we get going, it, it really is just a short amount of time before we're in the flow.
Well, I think that's really reassuring and should be for parents because although it seems like common sense that you'd make sure that everybody learning each other's names would be a priority, <laughs> that doesn't happen everywhere. I mean, I've had my kids start things like sports teams or something else where they neglect to make sure the kids know each other's names. And so right. that just basic thing is a huge, should be a huge comfort to parents of first time campers that their child will be known by name, by all the other kids in the group right, right away, which is a really important, important thing to happen. And you know, it's the structure of the organization. So um, our kids are, they know where they're going to sit for meals. You know, every element of camp is focused on making connections, having kids belong to this organization from the moment they get there to the moment they go home. So we designed it into our program, just like I know you do at yours and camps across the country. Kids come in, you know where you're going to sit for your meal. You're not wandering around with a um, tray trying to figure out where you're going to sit. When you sign up for activities, you have a special place where you're to be with your counselor in a certain format so that they do, they belong, they know what to do, where to be, how to navigate. This is why camps, most well-run camps do this a lot better than school. I don't yeah. know about you, but I remember going to a new school and that horrifying worry, where am I going to sit at lunch? Right. Who am I going to sit with? And right. so just, just that alone makes most camps completely different for kids socially because you have a place to belong before you've even arrived. There yeah. are people waiting for you who mm -hmm. know where you're going to be. And that's really cool. So Julie, I want to talk about just, you have a lot of specific things. You've already mentioned some of them that you focus on at Walton's mm -hmm. just specific outcomes that you're looking at beyond just the kids having a great time and learning some new activities. So when you think about your focus and how you train your staff, you've already mentioned some of the social skills. What else do you really focus on um, to help kids with kind of their social and emotional skills or character development while they're at Walton? Sure. Well, you're right. There's so many. And in being in camp, we know, right, that at the same time, we are working on just a myriad of things with these kids. And that's why kids come home and they are sold. I love camp, you know, and parents are like, what? What's that? You know, um, if I had to really define, you know, at, at Walton's, what we're, what we're focusing on every day, every minute, and it's really a balance between independence and being very connected. So oftentimes those two things, people say a very independent person might be less connected than another person. But for me, the crux of what we do is that balance and if we can constantly and continually focus on those two um, traits and help kids develop in both ways, then I think we're really, really helping um, some uh, in some very big ways. So, you know, independence, parents think, oh, yeah, well, they're away. So that's independent enough. They're just without me. So that but it is a process of independence, making choices about your activities, um, independence, unpacking all of your own stuff navigating with your counselor and the other members of your group about who's going to get which bed and how we're going to um, set up our cabin group together. You know, independence about um, learning that when you've made an activity choice and it's not your favorite, you're going to go and you'll be there and you can make another choice the next day, but really having that ownership. But that paired with teaching kids how to be truly connected with other people, which seems strange that we might have to teach those skills. Um, I think that's where the power really lies. And so the connections that we're making obviously start from the fact that we're out in nature, we spend most of our time outside. And so that is just good in general. Um, but in addition, we're free of technology. And boy, that's becoming really cliche now, right, about putting down the um, screens or limiting screen time. But Literally, when I say nobody's on their phone, I mean, I'm not on my phone. I mean, at all. I it I hide my phone in my office, even in a drawer, because yeah. phones out in public send a message that at some point I might get to pick up that phone. And I'm not, not when I'm in camp. So camp is this place where um, we're super intentional about those connections. So that's what I would say we really focus on is about the balance between being extremely independent and also very connected with the people in our community there at camp. 
That's such a great combo. And something that I know you actually even started a whole side business with yeah. is <laughs> your intentionality around meal times and what happens at meal times. And I feel like you could share some tips about what you do at Walton's that could help parents at home kind of create those closer connections around meals. So what are some of your thoughts and, and practices that you do to help with that connection at meal times? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that we focus on at Walton's and I know camps across the country focus on and really do a good job of this is about help having kids be contributors. So, being a contributor in any community that you're a part of, in a camp community, being a contributor is really powerful because you know your role, you know that you offer something to the community, you know that the community is depending on you for that role, right? And oftentimes you're recognized for your strengths. Um, so a lot of building a really strong connection in the community is about making sure that people know how to contribute and that they are contributing to their community. So around meals specifically, what does that mean? Well, at camp, um, everybody has a job related to the meal. Um, we eat family style at camp. Um, we all start at the same time. I don't know if you've ever had this situation in your family. I know I still do, um, you know, and that is that the food's ready. It's kind of a hustle and bustle. We're all sitting down to have dinner. And then so-and-so in my family has already started eating and I'm still dishing up my plate. And I'm thinking, hold on, I'm trying to get to the table. And not always. But sometimes we just have to stop and it's kind of like this starting together so that there's a definite, you know, beginning to this event that we're undertaking to have a meal together. Um, so for parents out there who are saying, all right, I, I like this idea of everyone contributing, but reality is I don't have time to do a big, huge thing where we're all contributing and I'm making homemade meals together and we're all, but those contributions can be more than just helping you cook. They can be just making decisions about what you're going to eat. They can be making decisions about where you're going to eat. They can be making decisions about the topic at the table. Um, so at camp, for example, there's the, you know, typical server and the setter and the scraper, um, the person that goes up and gets the food and brings it back. Those little things that we do in camp can be replicated at home. And it doesn't have to be every night. I don't want you, the parents are watching, you're like, ah, right, I'm never going to be able to do that every night or dinner or whenever we come together. But again, they can be your role that's assigned for the day that kids are able to do regardless of whether it's a sit around the table with a big fancy meal or it's really grabbing something but bringing it home and having it at the table there. So I would say meal time is a time when families can really just kind of do some of the same traditions that we do at camp at home. Yeah, I love that. Um, do you still have that business? Could people still oh, buy that's that? What you, that's what we started talking about. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's called Memorable Meal Times, And yeah. some other moms and I, uh, several years ago, our kids were taking the class in town. And so we started meeting and we, out of that, those conversations grew this idea to come up with a product um, around meal times. And the company Memorable Meal Times is definitely on a hold as we're all doing other things. Right okay. Now. But boy, <laughs> it was, it, we designed a product called the Enchanted Table. It's about conversation starters around meals. And here comes that word again, ready? Contribution cards so that everybody can contribute in the mealtime process. So parents out there, if you are thinking, well, what, okay, serving, setting, scraping, I get it. Those are just regular household chores. Well, some other kinds of contributions that you can do at home are have your young child design something as a centerpiece for their table. It can be a Lego stack. That's great. It can be some things from outside. They just arranged in the middle. It can be anything and everything. Um, have your child, you know, challenge them to set the table in a really unusual way that you've never seen before. We sure see that at camp. Um, giving them a job, a role for the week. So, um, yeah, that's one idea around meals. Yeah, I love that. I still have my enchanted dinner kit. And uh, yes, I still have it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I just think that's fabulous. And I do think that especially like if kids come back from Walton's and they've been doing these things at Walton's, what a great time to keep that up after they get home. Just have the parent to continue that so they can even ask their kid, oh, well, what was your contribution? What did you help out with? What did you like best? Let's keep that going after you get home from camp. That's a fabulous way to, to kind of keep up the, the camp camp vibe even after they get home. 
Well, you know, I, I had a parent who said to me prior to her child coming, you know, you're never, my, my child just hates meals. I can't even get him to sit at the table the whole time. I said, wow, well, how long are your meals? She's, I'm talking five minutes. I can't even, it's like up and gone, just does not like meal time. Doesn't, is it kind of a picky eater? Doesn't. And so she was very worried that this was going to be a hindrance at camp. You know, maybe um, we were going to have a hard time keeping him at the table or that because he, he just gets up and wanders and I've tried everything. Well, when she picked up her son, she found me at the welcome wagon and said, Julie, w tell me the secret. I said, uh, what? I'm going <laughs> to tell me the secret. How my son said he loved meals here. He loved everything about it. I said, oh yeah, you're right. You're you are the mom who said your son wouldn't even sit at the table. I didn't even it didn't sorry it didn't even come up. It was not a thing. You know, she wanted to know what we did, and what I said to her was, you know, your son loves the meals because he loves the traditions around our meals. He loves that he knows that that bell is the wash your hands and get in line, and here we go. And then there's a different bell which means shh, and then there's another bell, the cow bell, that means. The food's ready. You can, the person who's the server can go and get it. He loved all of that about, and he loved understanding that this is how this worked. He loved having a job. He could read the chart on the, in the dorm that said what his job was that day. The food isn't fancy. Our food is super kid friendly. It served family style. So we don't have a huge long buffet of everything under the sun. You know, there's something for everybody typically, and it's served separately so they can make their own combination, which is important for kids, especially when they're away for the first time and sometimes an unfamiliar food. He loved all that. He thought it was so cool that you could just pull your own things together and make it. And that was a really big kind of aha moment for her that she didn't have to come up with the most amazing meals. It could just be really, really simple. So she and I had been in contact about that. And um, that's, that's a good story to hear. Yeah, I think for a lot of kids, those kind of transformations happen at camp. Mm -hmm. um, I know kids sometimes discover a new food that they never would have tried at home, but because their cabin mates and counselor are trying it, they try it. So that's another amazing kind of positive outcome that's really lasting from camp is just new habits or new interests and that kind of thing. So that's a great story. Do you have any other stories from like parents or campers, like any testimonials that you've received? I know you get a lot. Do you happen to have one or any any handy for this? Well, I didn't have any written out in that way, but I do have that one about that meal that I just told you. I have another funny story, which um, I'll tell it. But okay, Karen, yes, Julie, I love your idea around traditions, but and so it, unless it's really top secret, I need to know your string bean recipe because. Every year at our Thanksgiving, everyone is allowed to choose one recipe for the meal. And so we've kind of adopted some of your traditions at camp. And so my daughter has chosen Walton's Grizzly Lodge string beans for the recipe. And I don't know how to replicate it. Could you at least tell me kind of a few tips, what you do? <laughs> well, Audrey, shh, just the can, number 10 tin of string beans is just a, we do use canned green meats for this one particular meal. Now we have plenty of fresh fruit, plenty of fresh vegetables, but for this particular meal, it were, they were canned string beans that were served. They, she couldn't believe it. Yeah. That they taste daughter's. better at camp though. And I have to say like string beans are one of those things that the can, like the softness of them, they're pretty good that way. Right. I know. I know. Yeah. I so like, cook them, you see them. But yeah, no, that in terms of the meal time, that's definitely it. But um, in terms of testimonials in the broader sense of things, you know, the themes that we hear are my child comes back and says they are the happiest at camp. Mm -hmm. They are the best version of themselves at camp. That camp is my second family. Camp is my second home. And if you haven't been to camp and like I did as a child or you don't work in the business, it can be very hard to understand what is this magic that we are part of, that we get to participate in every summer. Um, but that is it. It's, it's all of these um, traits and these um, traditions. And I know the things that you have focused on to try to highlight so that parents can have a little bit of that magic and bring it home for themselves, right? 
Well, yeah. And I think that's the whole reason for this series really is just letting people know that yes, actually at these camps like Walton's campers really are happier than they are at home. Right. And there's a reason for that because you are very intentional in the way you train your staff and the way you do things to get those feelings of connection and independence and all that great stuff. So that's really kind of the, the magic is really not magic. It's intentional practices by people who really know what they're doing like you. So that's what's, that's what's really awesome about this, just to be able to share with people about just the work that is happening at a lot of camps, but specifically at Walton's. So um, Julie, where can people find you? I'm going to put a link in the comments to your website, but why don't you just say the website name? And oh. also, what? Um, who can they talk to if someone has questions and they want to call? What's the process for just getting to know you a little bit better? Sure. So um, we're grizzlylodge.com. And that's our website and the phone number is there. They can call, they can email. And something that's kind of cool about um, our business is that you're going to get me, you're going to get my husband, or you'll get Erica and Jared, the four of us. Um, we are still very hands-on. Um, you can talk to any one of the four of us. Like I said, we're parents. Um, Adam and I have a background in education. My sister-in-law, Erica, is a nurse. Um, and Jared is our site guy. And so between all of us, we know the entirety of the business. Um, we think that the um, the best training, though, that we got, and not only in Jared and Adam growing up in camp, but is having our own kids. So between us, we have five kids. Um, and we are taking a lot of those practices at camp that we learned growing up in camp, really, because we all four have, um, and working them with our own kids at home. And sometimes that's where we have to go to, right? We think, what's going on here? We've got this situation, or we're trying to work on this as a family. If we look back to camp and how we spend our summers and try to bring a little bit of that summer home with us in our off-season lives, then we're like, oh, yeah, that's right. That works here, too. So yeah. I'm so excited to... Um, be reading your book and your blog posts and just be able to share that with parents. Oh, one other thing I want to say, parents, um, if you want to talk to some of the leading expert experts in child development, camp directors. So it's not about talking to you and getting you to come to Walton's Grizzly Lodge. I will want you to send your kid to camp, to a camp um, for that experience of um, independence and connection. Um, but really, all of us in camping are really wanting to talk to parents and to share our ideas, the things that we know are working because we're in youth development and we love what we do. So um, that's how you can get a hold of us. That's where we are. <laughs> that's awesome. Julie, this has been terrific. I am so glad that we got connected through our... <laughs> And um, and I tech support. Come on, we made exactly. It. <laughs> um, this has been so great, and I hope that many families reach out to you after watching this and just connect with you. Whether they need advice about family dinner or green beans, or if they're thinking about Waltons for this summer. <laughs> so thanks so much for coming on, Julie. And um, I'm sure we'll be talking soon too as we connect outside of Facebook. Right. Audrey, thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody.